so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas John Jones. Um, I run a small organization called Praxis, uh, which is an arts and cultural organization based in Oslo. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this event, uh, Listening to Rivers with Leif Barclay and Anir Lockwood. Um, Anir Lockwood is originally from New Zealand, but she now joins us from her home in New York. Uh, she's Professor Emerita at Vassar College. Uh, and in the course of her distinguished career, she's made works ranging from sound art experiments environmental sound installations uh, to concert music. Um, her recent works include Wild Energy, which is composed with Bob uh, Bilecki. Uh, it's a site-specific installation focused on geophysical, atmospheric and mammalian infra and ultrasound sources, and it's permanently installed at the Carmel Center for Music and the Arts uh, in Katona, New York. Um, her music is discussed in diverse publications, including Douglas Carr's staple survey of the history of sound art, Noise, Water, Meat. And an Australian sound artist, designer and researcher, Leah Barclay, works at the intersection of art, science and technology. For the last decade, her research and production have focused on innovative approaches to recording and dissemination of the soundscapes of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Her work has been commissioned, performed and exhibited internationally at uh, organizations including the Smithsonian Museum and UNESCO, and her augmented reality sound installations have been presented international locations, including Times Square in New York City and the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Um, she leads various research projects in the field of ecoacoustics, including the Biosphere Soundscapes, uh, which is in association with UNESCO's Biosphere Reserves Initiative, and River Listening in association with the Australian Rivers Institute. So this event is taking place alongside Praxis's 18th residency, which is titled Climata Capturing Change at the Time of Ecological Crisis. Uh, and the exhibition Klima 2 Plus, which is going on at the Norsk Technisk Museum, Norwegian, Norway's National Museum of Science and Technology. Uh, the Klimata Residency brings together nine people to explore topics relating to sound and ecology, and it's been developed with the German sound artist Lasse Marquik uh, and the Goethe Institute Norway, and it includes collaborations with Grün Recorder, Technisk Museum and Nortam. And the Klima 2 Plus exhibition is exploring climate change by bringing together scientific perspectives, insights from critical humanities and arts, and it invites action through art interventions, practical workshops and activism. Um, and this talk is part of a series uh, relating to sound and ecology. So if this is something that you're particularly interested in, there is a link in the chat where you can have a look at some of the other events that are happening around this. Um, and so I'd say it's welcome to have so many people with us. Um, and actually, we are really curious about where you might be. So if you don't mind, it'd be really interesting if people would use the chat function to write the city or place that you're joining from right now. It's very interesting to get an overview. Um, and the other thing that I think is quite nice, uh, if you're happy to do this, is just to turn on all of our cameras for a short while so that we get a sense of the human beings that are with, with us. It's my pleasure to hang hand over to Anaya to start this. Thank you, Nicholas. So I want to start by describing something I'm excited about still, a significant development in river protection and conservation. On March 14th, 2017, in a world first, a river was granted legal personhood. The Te Awa Tupua, or Whanganui River in New Zealand, which I remember from childhood as a beautiful, calm river flowing through low hills and bush, a wild river then and still now, the country's longest navigable river and its third largest. And on that date, the New Zealand Parliament voted to pass a bill settling the historic claims of the Whanganui Iwi or tribe as they relate to the river. A highly significant part of that bill centered on, to quote, the legal recognition of Te Awa Tupua as comprising the river from the mountains to the sea, its tributaries, and all its physical and metaphysical elements as an indivisible and living whole. It furthermore establishes that the river is a legal person and has all the rights, powers, duties, and liabilities of a legal person. And the bill went on to create a well-funded office to be the human face of Te Awa Tupu, to act for, speak for, and on behalf of the river, stipulating that the two people staffing the office must act consistently in the interests of the river and with, an, with the intrinsic values that represent its essence including among others, and again I quote, that the Iwi and the Hapua or sub-tribe of the Whanganui River have an inalienable connection with 
and responsibility to Te Awa Tupua and its health and well being. The tribes have a saying I am the river, and the river is me. The river is kin. And the river's new status ensures that if it's harmed now, the law will not differentiate between harming the tribe and harming the river. I also feel strongly that rivers are alive, are living entities. I've been fascinated with their behaviors and sounds since my childhood when I spent a lot of time in New Zealand's Southern Alps near a powerful, then wild river, the Waimakariri. This river rises in the mountains, icy cold always, and creates wide gravel beds with a number of channels as it moves through the mountains and across the Canterbury Plains to the Pacific. It's a highly mobile, fast river up in the mountains, of course. So each year when we went up to the mountains to stay there for a while, it was really interesting to see where the main channel had moved to and how its sound field had changed. That river stayed in my mind during the years of composing with many different sound sources, a sort of buried influence, like an aquifer, perhaps. I started compiling a recorded archive, intended tongue-in-cheek, to include all the world's rivers, creeks, down to springs, etc. And it never grew to be more, more than a few recordings. But then in 82, I completed my first river sound map, a sound map of the Hudson River, for the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers, New York making recordings all the way down from the source to the ocean. It is an installation, as are all three of my river sound maps. And after opening at that museum, it's traveled to a number of other places and a shorter version was issued on a CD by Lovely Music. Then I set river studies aside for a number of years while working on many other forms of music. But in 2001, I felt a longing to be working with water sound again. I'd just retired from teaching and I was full of free floating energy and open time. And what is a river? What is its being? Became an insistent question for me. It was something I didn't feel I'd explored fully while working on the Hudson. So I was talking this over with my spouse, a terrific composer, Ruth Anderson, over breakfast one morning. And when she asked which river, the Danube came to mind immediately, didn't even consider any other river. In a series of slow journeys, each four to six weeks long, from 2002 to 2004, we traveled downriver from the sources in the Black Forest to the huge Delta and the Black Sea. I was using a simple recording system. My criterion has long been that my equipment setup should be small enough to carry in a light backpack. An Audio-Technica stereo mic for the Danube, a Rykut windshield, headphones, of course, a small tripod mic stand, a high quality hydrophone lent to me very generously by the composer Maggie Payne, and a Sony DAC recorder small enough to fit safely in my shirt pocket if I have to perch somewhere. As I went, I was also seeking out and talking with people whose lives are intimately bound up with the river and shaped by it. I've long been curious about why we're so powerfully drawn to rivers. So I asked them, what does the river mean to you? And could you live without it? And that second question often drew out strong feeling. For Mikhail Frischel, a cabinet maker from Grein, Austria, for me not to live on the Danube would be a catastrophe. I couldn't function. A crazy energy comes from the current. You have to go with it. It's a completely different world. And for that reason, for us, it influences your mood and your psyche so much. It's the best medicine for us. And Ferschel is somebody who would take his small boat out on the river when it was streaming down river at a very fast rate. And the government had put out a warning that all boats should be off the river. That was particularly the time he'd love to get on the river. He was, he was great to talk with. So Nicholas, could we play the first exit? I'll just introduce it. That's Ober Kienstadt. Yes, yeah, so the way that we're going to play the links um, from Anaya in order to ensure that there is good quality is in the chat, I now have put the first link. Um, if everyone clicks that, please. Um, and then, well, Anaya, do you want to introduce it? And then we can all hit uh, play when you're done. And then we give a moment and then we'll all come back together again. Here's Ferschel explaining 
what you're about to hear. It's a sound that had puzzled me when I first heard it way upstream in Ulm in Germany. It alarmed me and made me worry I would damaged Maggie's hydrophone and I remember rushing back to my hotel from the river up in Ulm and filling a, the bath full of water and sticking the hydrophone in to make sure the connections were functioning, which of course they were perfectly. It was just a sound I'd never heard a river make before. What it is, it's a fluctuating hissing in which, which small rocks and sand are making when they're sluiced, as they're sluiced rapidly downstream by the current, they're moving downstream really fast. And Ferschel said, when you go downstream from here, from Grein, you have a beautiful landscape, mountains left and right. But when you go upstream, there are no dams anymore and the Danube flows much faster. Then you can hear the Danube sing. When the current flows at its original speed, you can hear the gravel on the bottom hissing, which we call the Danube singing. And the rivermen know the sound very well. They can hold the, if they're, if they're using, if they're rowing, small boat with wooden oars, they just hold the end of the oars up to their ears and they can, it transduces through the oars. They can hear it perfectly clearly, love the sound. So here it is at Oberkienstock, a little west of Vienna, underwater recording, of course, recorded at 11.37 in the morning in May of 2004. So perhaps it's catching some of the late spring runoff. You're hearing the pink noise band, the singing of the gravel moving downstream with its slight fluctuations a little higher than lower. The movement across the stereo field I built into it, the recording is mono. And also the gorgeous complex swirls of the water motion coming and going unpredictably with a subtle phrasing which never repeats in phrase length. It's a very clear example of what I love in river sounds in their textures, the layering. So if you would click the link and we can hear it. So the next track was recorded at Dobra, a small village in Serbia near the border with Bulgaria. And I'm recording a little tributary flowing through a meadow just before it enters the Danube. This is a many layered song. So let's listen to it. We'll hear it twice, but I'll talk in between. Yeah, so this is C Dobra. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
so what drew my attention to that site was that gorgeous sort of mid-range mezzo line in it, There's distinct pitches forming a complex and fast moving melody, which I could hear from the road, only just, but enough to entice me into the meadow. I settled down to record and an, an older woman came walking alongside the tributary and looked at my setup and said, what you doing? And I was just crossing my fingers at the mic and caught her voice. It sort of does, but it's a little, it's overlaid by this really active stream sound. But I love that moment. Above that and around that melody is an intricate mesh of individual splashes. It's a very active water surface with little fragments of a counter melody audible every so often. May we listen again, please, Nicholas? Thank you. So my intention with the sound maps and my environmental recordings in general is to record and then compose and spatialize the installation in such a way that as a listener, you're drawn inside the sound. No separation between you and the sound and thus between you and the river. My hope is that this experience of immersion in the river's energy will evoke a river you know well, a personally beloved river. <laughs> one which is special to you, and out of that, concern and care for its health. In the composing, I use very minimal processing, just some balancing, e equalization, and very occasionally a little bit of reverb, because I want the river's sonic energy to come to you as directly as possible. So in general, I was recording from the bank. We would, Ruth and I would hire an old, beat up rental car, usually in Budapest, and then just drive down river, finding the old fishermen's roads running alongside the river, drive as close to the river as possible, traveling very small, short distances often in a day, and uh, choosing everything. I choose all the site, my sites by ear, as it were. It's not a documentary. I'm not aiming to document the rivers. Um, so, I was recording from the bank in general, and I didn't want to record um, by boat on the river in order not to involve boat sounds in the mix, and in order along the bank in order to get as close to the water as possible, which meant I was always aware of and working with the interplay between the river and the physical site, the current in bank materials, current in riverbed. And at Rushova, while I was absorbed in watching some people drive their truck down the bank into the water, into the water to wash it, it was about half, over half in the water, and I was trying to figure out if they'd ever be able to back out of there again. So while I was distracted, Ruth, who was listening, noticed a delicious river sound, and she traced it to a section of soft clay bank in which the river had carved an overhang, almost a complete resonant tube. I could lie on my stomach on the bank, lean over and hold the mic right inside the tube, which was a perfect setup. So let's hear the last clip. It's just over three minutes. 
Thank you, Nicholas. Just briefly explain the installation itself. Um, the, the installation I use for the structure I use for the Danube, I've also used for the Housatonic and the Hudson, consists of a, a large map of the river on, a, on canvas, on, a, on an exhibition site wall, for example. And next to the map is a small time display. Um, by checking the time display and going back to the map, you can discover which part of the river you're listening to at any one point and a little information about it. Um, and there, uh, let's see, the Hudson was stereo, the Danube is a 5.1 set up with the speakers arranged in a circle. So you're surrounded by the river uh, with comfortable seating in the middle where you can just sort of sack out and <laughs> relax and really let it flow right through you. Um, there are, there's a book, uh, each time for the Danube especially because the interviewees were talking to me in their own language or dialect. Uh, There's a book of translation of the interviews and for a long time I would create a sort of river of rocks which I'd gathered as I went downstream from the riverbed actually uh, and lay it under the map for people to pick up and feel and see how the river had shaped the rock and scratched it and, and rounded it. A, a sort of tactile connection in an otherwise virtual setup. I think, just to, to, to wind up, I think what fascinated me as a child about the Waimakariri in New Zealand was a clear sense that the river has agency, something unarticulated but exciting to me. And then again in Rashova, recording inside that overhang, I realized how the Danube 
creates its sounds by the way it shapes its banks and bed, how it has agency. I'd started this project, as I said, impelled by questions, what is a river? What is its being? And I'd recorded aquatic and terrestrial insects, frogs and tadpoles, fish, herons, people, geese, wind and reed beds, beds wind and willows, listening to how they all interweave, how all are dependent on the river, and thus how the river shapes its whole environment far beyond its banks. By the end of the journey on July 3rd, 2004, walking along the Svantu Gheorghe channel in Romania down to the Black Sea, this was so clear to me and I felt filled with gratitude to the river. How then to express this gratitude for the sounds we hear from the world, which nourish us so greatly. Given all the many ways in which sound enters us, moving directly into and through your bones, cavities, liquids, we can feel deeply permeated by sound. And when this happens, I think we're making a form of visceral contact with the source of a sound, making it an intimate channel of connection, interconnection, interconnection, through which to experience other phenomena. Can we go further to a feeling of deep interconnectedness and then act from that as we're now urgently aware that we need to do, as the Te Awa Tupua are doing on the, the Iwi is doing on the Whanganui River, as Leah is doing with tremendous creative energy and initiative in Australia and worldwide. That is reciprocity in action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, Leah, let me hand over to you before we come on with the questions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here, um, Nicholas. And yeah, that was just such a, a beautiful talk, Anaya. It's always a privilege to hear you speak and such a privilege to share the stage or the Zoom with you um, tonight or this afternoon, wherever on the planet you are at the moment. I'm coming to you from the Sunshine Coast at the moment where I'm um, very close to the Maruchi River, which is one of the rivers I'm going to talk briefly about. Um, and I thought what I would do was basically give a, a snapshot of the river listing project, which is the project that I've been running for about uh, just over five years now, which is sort of growing out of this idea of exploring the artistic and scientific possibilities of listening to rivers and initially growing out of my um, creative practice, which was very much inspired by um, Anaya's incredi incredible body of work as well. So I'm going to um, screen share from another computer just so I can get good quality audio. So I guess this um, idea of um, exploring the soundscapes of rivers with hydrophones has always been a really key focus of my practice. And, you know, hydrophones, underwater microphones have become, I guess, really the key tool of, of everything I'm doing, both sort of as an artist and as someone who's become deeply involved in the scientific possibilities of listening to rivers. And I guess, you know, all of this sort of work started for me um, when I became really fascinated with just how different rivers in different parts of the world sounded, you know, that it was so unpredictable when I dropped the hydrophones into the water and shared these sounds with communities I was working with. Um, there was, these were some participants in a workshop in Cambodia, listening to the sound of aquatic insects for the first time and just always fascinated by how diverse these soundscapes were, how dramatic the soundscapes changed throughout the day as well to have this dawn chorus of aquatic insects throughout wetlands along river systems which you know even just in the course of two or three hours would change so dramatically in this soundscape and I started to get you know really interested in this idea 
of these sounds being an indicator of the health of this ecosystem. And, you know, I think it's really interesting when we look at the surface of, of a river like the one we're looking at now in, in Kerala in South India, um, you know, we, we really have no idea what's happening beneath the surface of that water, you know, and the, the impacts of climate change are often so visible in terrestrial ecosystems, yet these very dramatic changes in freshwater ecosystems are really going unnoticed, you know, simply due to visibility. And so when I started to get really involved in the scientific possibilities of listening to rivers and freshwater ecology more broadly, you know, I thought that there would be various methods that we could map to these soundscapes to really understand river health. And what I was really confronted by, you know, when diving into the science was the fact that so many of the techniques that were still very actively used and are still actively used today are incredibly invasive to rivers, you know, they're and also, you know, not necessarily that reliable either. One of my main collaborators on the River Listing Project, Dr. Simon Linke, um, you know, often says these classic methods don't reflect reality. These are methods that, you know, capture and release and electrofishing aren't giving us this accurate picture of what's happening in a river system. Yet when we think about listening to a river, you know, many of the species that we're trying to monitor to understand biodiversity all make sound. So it seems like quite an obvious um, thing that we would listen to rivers to understand the health of rivers. And just to give you an example. <laughs> So that was a black drum thing. My attempts to do a smooth audio transition didn't go quite as successful as anticipated then. Um, but that was, I, I was intending to give you um, some insight into what those sounds actually were between that. But um, as you can hear, you know, each of those specific species of fish and aquatic insects, you know, have a very distinctive and identifiable sound. And that's what really started to fascinate me. Um, early in this work was this idea that, you know, we can almost think of these fish and these macroinvertebrates having an acoustic fingerprint that we can identify in the same way, you know, we're using different species, uh, well, the same way we're identifying different species of birds in terrestrial environments and the intersections then with creative practice as well and the, the artistic and scientific possibilities of, of really listening to rivers. And that really drew me into this idea of ecoacoustics. So looking at capturing these long durational soundscapes of river systems over, um, you know, long temporality, uh, long temporality. So, um, you know, weeks and months at a time, and then using different visualization techniques to really measure those changes. So these recordings and these visualizations become both a, a measure of river health, but then these engaging audio visual experiences to give us a sense of what's happening in these river systems and how it changes throughout the day. So I'll just play this example as well. Thank <laughs> you. 
So that just gives you a snapshot of, um, I guess, short samples of some of these different um, audiovisual river pieces and some of those are just obviously a few seconds from what are 24 hour recordings and sometimes 48 hour recordings as well. Um, and I wanted to share this image because this was actually the first time I, I met Anaya when we were doing some hydrophone recording on the Hudson River in New York, which I was um, absolutely thrilled to finally get the chance to meet Anaya face to face and to be both be wandering along the banks of the Hudson River um, with hydrophones exploring these quite fascinating soundscapes. I seem to remember we had a lot of boat sounds um, that day, Anaya, but a wonderful experience and where we really started to talk about, you know, some of these artistic and scientific possibilities as well. And, and also, um, I guess, the, the wave of accessibility around um, devices like hydrophones and the education possibilities of that as well. And I think that's what's become, you know, really exciting for me in the last few years is how incredibly accessible and affordable hydrophones are now. If we think of, you know, from a scientific perspective, even just a few years ago, you know, this was a standard setup for marine grade hydrophones where you're having to make quite a significant investment with obviously skilled scuba divers, a, a pretty serious boat and scientists to get rigs in the water where we're now at the point where we can capture the same quality of acoustic data with a device like a Raspberry Pi that can fit in the palm of our hand. So it's a pretty exciting time, you know, for both the artistic and scientific possibilities of this field when we have such accessible technologies. And that was really you know, what underpinned the River Listening Project is, is making this technology as accessible as possible and getting it in the hands of communities and really exploring the cultural and biological diversity of river systems. And, you know, we've been super lucky to um, facilitate this project in different parts of the world. And, you know, the most important thing for me in a lot of these um, you know, different expeditions on rivers has been the community engagement to really find pathways to bring conservation organisations, artists, scientists, local community members and schools together. And I like often to, to share this image in the context of the early stages of this project, because this is um, Marilyn O'Connell, who's uh, not far from where I am right now on the Mary River, and she's a, a specialist of the Mary River turtles. And, you know, she was very, very sceptical of these scientists and artists from the city um, coming out to her river system and, and listening to the river. She thought it was a little bit ridiculous, this idea of, um, you know, listening to rivers to understand the health of rivers. And, you know, this was a river system that she knew so well you know she used to say kind of like the back of her hand and she would know the exact spots where all the turtles were and would be able to describe you know points where they would pop their heads up and knew exactly which rocks we should go to to position the hydrophones and this was sort of the first moment where she put headphones on and was completely enthralled by these sounds beneath the surface, you know, having not experienced a hydrophone or listened to a river before, um, was completely immersed in this soundscape and realised there was this entire element of this ecosystem that she loved and that she felt so connected to that um, she just wasn't aware of. And for me, that some of the most exciting parts of this project is, I guess, facilitating ways for um, communities to connect with their river systems in ways that they don't traditionally think about. And I think, um, you know, for Marilyn, this was kind of a turning point in, in some of her research as well. And we've since created these acoustic monitoring projects with the Mary River Turtle and had... Um, basically multiple acoustic ecology projects happening on this river system as well. It's become one of the main sites. And, you know, there has been a lot of scepticism in the way we've been running this project um, in, in different parts of Australia as well. And, you know, people not necessarily being enthusiastic about the scientific possibilities of listening to rivers, which is why we've invested um, 
as much time as possible in um, in writing about this research and publishing it in in scientific journals. And I was really excited to have um, this paper published just a few months ago. Actually, it's in uh, Freshwater Science Journal, so quite a a prevalent scientific journal. And you know, this paper was really about laying the foundations for what the river listening project is is about but also acknowledging the fact that um you know people like anaya have been pioneering this work for decades and it's interesting now we're having this wave of scientists come into this field and realize that we can use the sounds of a river system to measure river health which is absolutely brilliant and very exciting but it was important for me you know with a paper like this to really acknowledge the pioneering work that Anaya has done in in really creating that first um, river archive and allowing people to understand that, um, you know, many of these things in rivers are making these incredible soundscapes that can allow us to connect to these ecosystems in in new ways. And we've also had um, some, I guess, models published around how we can actually use freshwater ecoacoustics as this continuous ecosystem monitoring tool and you know in parallel to this always having creative outcomes at every stage of the project so it is that equal balance between artistic and scientific possibilities um i won't play this video right now but that particular paper sparked some interesting press in australia where we ended up with um, singing fish on the news, which was quite exciting. And, you know, for me, these projects have always been about creating pathways for, for young people to really engage in the work uh, as well from both sort of scientific and artistic perspectives. Some of our students um, in Brisbane and these were some students at, uh, as part of a workshop at the University of Hull. And for you know the workshops where we're introducing hydrophones to young students we've made a point over the last few years to um to actually allow students to build hydrophones so that they're taking hydrophones home with them after these workshops and you know can continue recording the river and interacting with these river soundscapes as well uh, an example of one of jez riley french's hydrophones there but we also just make really simple hydrophones with kids, a, a waterproof contact mic essentially. And um, it's always such a, a really exciting process where they can kind of spend the morning making hydrophones and then the afternoon putting the hydrophones in the river and, and recording those soundscapes and feeling quite connected to the hydrophone that they've made and that they can take home with them too. And then, you know, all of these sounds that students are recording can also feed into these different river databases that we're developing. So, you know, the students then kind of have agency in the scientific mapping of the project and, you know, really feel part of the research itself. And I'll just skip through a, a, a little bit of this briefly because I just wanted to touch on the live streaming elements of this project as well. We've put a big focus in the last couple of years in actually building these live streaming kits where we can listen to rivers in real time. So a really accessible kit there using a, an Aquarian hydrophone and a Raspberry Pi. And this is, I guess, the smallest and simplest version of the kit where you know, it's all kind of set up and ready to go. So we can essentially post this anywhere on the planet and all, um, you know, a community member would have to do is essentially open the box and plug the battery in, turn the Raspberry Pi on, put the solar panel on top and it will stream straight to the, the sound map in real time. So this idea that we can have these live streaming nodes um, really accessibly in different parts of the world and, be listening to rivers um, in real time. And there's simple mobile versions of this too. And for um, World Listening Day last year in 2019, we, we basically ran this project called Listening with Three Rivers, where we ran multiple live streams at dawn and dusk um, as sort of 90 minute performances um, on these three rivers in Queensland. And this was all inspired by 
um, the theme that Anaya coined for World Listening Day last year, which was um, listening with. So we were looking at this idea of listening with these rivers as opposed to listening to these rivers and then trying to understand how the community actually interacted with um, with these live broadcasts of river systems as well. So this is just an example of the interface. I won't play these soundscapes right now, but they're all on SoundCloud. If you do want to have a listen to some of the examples from all of these different live streams. And then one of the most important creative outcomes just to finish off with, with this project has been building um, augmented reality sound maps. So creating these river listening sound walks where we're basically taking the sounds and the creative responses to the river system and other scientific databases as well and planting them back along the banks of the river. So then um, community members can essentially download the app to their phone and walk along the riverbank and trigger those soundscapes. And these can also connect to live streams as well. So you can basically open your phone and connect to a live hydrophone that might be streaming from the middle of the river system. And that app is um, basically in development with a, a new version of the River Listing app, which allows you to plug a hydrophone directly into your phone and either stream or record um, straight to the database. And, you know, creating these works where you know you're able to walk along the river system and you know both record and be part of that art science project so sort of this participatory experience but then engaging with the river system um, in real time as well and the sort of latest iteration of that which was done just a couple of weeks ago is um you know, a response in many ways to the COVID lockdown we've all been in instead of taking people sort of out on this participatory experience um, on the river system, it was much more about taking the river to people in their homes. So we, well, I worked with Lyndon Davis, Gubby Gubby Songman and um, Trisha King, who's a photographer uh, at the same university as me, the University of the Sunshine Coast. And we documented different environments across the Sunshine Coast, the river, the Marucci River pictured here in particular, um, and created this live transient experience, which was designed to kind of bring the river in real time into people's homes. So, you know, this beautiful evocative river system creating all these different layers in response to it. You know, as an example here, the hydrophone, which is sort of sitting in the mangrove mud and Lyndon's playing didgeridoo, um, over the hydrophone and so it was essentially the didgeridoo was making the entire riverbed sort of resonate with this really rich sound um, layered in with these macro invertebrates and snapping shrimp and you know a really beautiful real-time experience which you know was sort of exploring in in a lockdown context how can we actually bring these river systems into people's homes and you know, like I said, for me, one of the most important things is is always creating these pathways where where young people can can engage with this work, even if we are sort of playing with very exploratory and experimental um, science and you know new ways to use technology from creative perspectives. It's always super important for me to create these pathways for um, young people to be able to engage with this work as well. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you both. I mean, uh, the round of applause that you would deserve if we were all in the room together. <laughs> um, and so at this point, in a way, um, we'd like it to be something of an open conversation, really, but uh, as well as an opportunity for the two of you to maybe pick up on things that you've noticed um, in each other's work or moments you'd like to explore uh, some crossover or differences. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of starting this, I mean, does anyone have a, an immediate response or question that they would like to come forward with? So, I mean, for me. Hello. Sorry? Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Jaime Rojas. I am uh, in, in Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, I, I met Anya a long time ago in New York City. Uh, 
Right now, I am doing a sound map of the Iguazu River, which starts very near the city of Curitiba and ends in the Parana River near the Iguazu Falls. And um, I'm, I'm also facing uh, exceticism, exceticism uh, because uh, this is part of a PhD in music composition. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not a scientific exceticism, it's an artistic exceticism because uh, it's like a very traditional program and uh, the, the compositions I'm, I'm making, which are very, very using small process. Uh, I mean, at, at my university, they're expecting them to be more aestheticized and more processed. And, they're not valuing uh, the, the work of going to the river and recording. They expect more like a post-production for the, I don't know. This is a first hurdle and uh, I, I guess a, a, a question for, for Anea and Lea is how, how to overcome those hurdles. I would think Leia's, Leia's systems of direct involvement, of low-cost systems of direct involvement uh, with the river would be a perfect way to, a perfect way to make an end run around that and the insistence on an aesthetic, uh, aestheticized structure and uh, framework for what you're doing. And it's wonderful to hear you're making the river map there. <laughs> it's marvelous news. <laughs> what? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'd add to that as well and, and say, yeah, I mean, it sounds like fantastic work you're doing. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're really seeing this, well, I feel like we're seeing this uprising of, of acoustic ecology work and, and ecological sound art in a more traditional composition context more so now i mean i guess it's always been bubbling around there to to a certain degree but it feels like there's many you know tradition more traditional conservatoriums in the world that are you know really i guess embracing and accepting um how um valuable you know a, a traditional approach to to field recording is and that you know, in many ways, uh, a pure field recording, a pure hydrophone recording from, from a river system. I mean, if that's the response that you've captured of the river and that's the voice of the river and, and as a composer, you don't feel that it needs to be processed or, or edited or manipulated in a way, then, I mean, I would certainly push back on whoever's um, suggesting that it's essential to, to manipulate those sounds for them to be considered compositions because um you know i mean that's that's the voice of the river and i mean uh, you know anaya's work articulates that so so brilliantly as well and i mean i think there's an opportunity to reference the fact that well someone like you know anaya has been doing this incredible work for for many many years now and there's so many examples of composers across the planet that are i think becoming much more um respected in in more traditional contexts as well i mean as an example in australia you know just last night we had our um our art music awards so our sort of traditional um national i guess classical music awards that happen annually and and the person that received the um distinguished service to australian music awards so the sort of top award for for classical music was was dr rose bent and she received that award for her pioneering work in, in acoustic ecology and her exploratory practice of experimental sound art and her work with hydrophones. So I think, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities to really push back on that expectation to, um, you know, compose field recordings in a way that there may have been um, expectations in, in a conservatorium context. My um, articulate sentences may be getting slightly vague since it's the middle of the night here in Australia. 
hopefully that answered your question a bit. Uh, thank you. That and also, I'm doing. And what you what you're doing is is demonstrating what Leah has been so brilliantly doing for a long time now, opening up, opening up the concept of composition, as she just said, but actually opening it out into interrelated and vital aspects of the world we physically and actually live in. Um, and that should be something which music departments embrace. It's a wonderful expansion of what sound work and composition can become. A lifeline, a lifeline to the world. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, and I noticed here a similar kind of question for advice in the chat. Uh, Sonia has asked, um, probably this question for you, Leah, but uh, if they were interested in listening with the river in South Africa, how could they go about it? And could they request a river listening box, for example? Absolutely. You can send me an email and I'd be happy to sort you out with one of those, definitely. Um, and I mean, there's, there's plenty of... Um, options to to get different hydrophones and small scale recorders now as well so there's yeah i mean a lot i'd be really happy to share some resources with you of of devices that you can sort of hand make yourself um but absolutely i mean through the river listening project with the um the streaming kits we're sort of scaling those up over the next year and it would be amazing to have a, a river in south africa on the map as well so yeah i'd be very happy to talk further about that yeah. and I mean, I wanted to thank you both for, for really interesting presentations um, and, and fantastic work. And I, I thought it was really, really nice that in you know, the way at the end you described kind of how you're kind of, you're in your process, you're seeking to appreciate, kind of celebrate the beauty, but also the importance of the rivers um, through your work. I mean, it seems such a nice way to approach a creative act in a way. And similarly with, with Leia, kind of taking the scientific and the kind of activist or important environmental work, but also dealing with it in a way that looks to open it up to many people and be able to explore it in kind of both the sort of flexibility that an artistic practice can have, but at the same time with the kind of rigorous nature of working with scientists or from a scientific perspective is really, really important. Well, I was kind of also and there you talked about how you were attracted to the agency of rivers you know that you were kind of attracted to the fact that they do something that they're important that they have an effect and i think that's something that both of you are kind of clearly motivated by and i wondered if um you could talk a bit a little bit about what you see as the agency of rivers well the the, the um, most uh obviously evident place to start is how they shape landscapes, how they, how the Danube cuts through the Carpathians and a number of several other mountain chains. Um, so that when I'm listening to a river, that is in my mind too. And, and I find it thrilling to realize that as I'm listening to that hissing sound in Oberkinstock and all up and down the river, um, I'm hearing the river carry the mountains down to the ocean, down to the Black Sea rather. I'm, I'm hearing it in real time, changing the landscape, little by little by little by inexorably changing the landscape, a, a geological process and going on audible in real time. And I find that totally thrilling. And it grounds me in a sense, you know, um, it, it enables me to feel that I'm really a part of that process. Mm. Mm, I mean, I would say as well, you know, this, this idea, I guess that that's such a, a prevalent idea across the planet of, of rivers, you know, truly being the lifeblood of, of communities and how, I guess, how we're increasingly getting towards this point where, um, you know, we just need to have better ways to, to understand and protect and manage freshwater ecosystems. You know, there's so many examples across the planet of where that kind of mismanagement and that, that lack of respect for a river system has just resulted in complete environmental 
disasters and you know whether that's damming a river in in north india or just complete you know mismanagement of of rivers in parts of australia that i think when you're providing these pathways for communities to to understand the value of that river system as the lifeblood of communities and and as a an ecosystem that is home to you know all of these different species as well species that are so valuable for that ecological balance that when you're providing these pathways for people to yeah understand um the value of river health and what's actually happening beneath the surface it's um you know it's it feels like it's critical and urgent to be doing those things at the moment and i've um you know been really privileged in, in an australian context as well to to work with a lot of indigenous custodians of river systems and you know being able to i guess learn how to think about rivers from different perspectives and different knowledge systems has been really really inspiring in my practice of, of sort of thinking about the the agency of rivers in a landscape as well thank you i have a question hmm. okay um I was um, I'm very grateful for your uh, presentation. It's so incredibly interesting and, and great work. Um, I'm especially happy also for the, um, this perspective of, of uh, being uh, non of, of non separation, and uh, and yeah, that you talk about your work also as a as a way to connect and also possibly make, make a, a ground for people to connect uh, with the river and uh, yeah. So I find that really, really uh, interesting because uh, yeah, that the praxis of listening is an incredibly valuable thing to share and to learn and explore. Um, so uh, I was also wondering about you, you you briefly mentioned, Leia, the noise pollution. And um, I came to think of, uh, yeah, there is, um, in Norway, we have people, scientists that uh, suggested, uh, for instance, uh, to have a national park under, as a submarine national park to protect large areas uh, because they are so polluted with noise and, and at the same time populated by whales and species that are really disturbed by, by this. And I wonder if you have some uh, reflections upon that man, uh, human-made, uh, you know, uh, no. Uh, and if you yeah. seek oh, that uh, sources sometime or deal with it yeah yeah just how you deal with that <laughs> yeah sure yeah did did you want me to answer some of that one or did you want to respond to that Anna? no i think you're the perfect person to discuss right. <laughs> um i guess uh yeah i mean for, for the research from a, a scientific perspective i mean i've been pretty involved in um in aquatic ecology work in in marine environments as well so we've done quite a bit of work particularly along the east coast of australia around the impact of anthropogenic noise on the great barrier reef for example and um migration patterns of, of humpback whales and you know you can mirror quite a lot of that in in freshwater ecosystems as well just that incredible impact that anthropogenic noise has and you know those um, those images I was showing before of the river systems that we did in response to, um, you know, Anaya's provocation for World Listening Day 2019, it was interesting to think of the contrast between two of those river systems. So the Brisbane River, which is in a very urban environment in the middle of a major Australian city, and the Noosa River, which is in the middle of a protected national park and biosphere reserve and soundscape wise the comparison between those and the impact of anthropogenic noise was confronting because the hydrophones in the Noosa National Park were at the river mouth and there was just a constant run of boats and jet skis just going backwards and forwards so it's this protected national park where you know you'll be fined $1,200 if you litter or something like that but 
you can literally drive around and around in circles in jet skis um, with this incredibly loud soundscape through the river system. So when you're sort of looking at that comparison between a river in an urban environment that had at that point in time, you know, hardly any anthropogenic noise and then this, what we're considering a pristine protected river, which just sounded um, overwhelmingly intense. Um, you know, we were trying to use that as a, as a tool to really bring more awareness around the impact that those sounds are having in the river system. And there's been some other scientific research projects uh, around rivers in southeast Queensland on the impact of anthropogenic noise, particularly jet skis on things like oyster reefs and aquatic plants and different species of fish and naturally things like um, different cetaceans, dolphins, things like that. So it feels like because there's been, I guess, so much work in that marine space around the impact of anthropogenic noise, you know, particularly when we're talking about things like seismic testing, um, it's still quite underdeveloped research scientifically in, in freshwater ecoacoustics, but there's certainly an uprising at the moment. And I would hope that, you know, that's going to hopefully shift legislation and things like that over the next few years in terms of um, potentially having things like jet skis uh, with different, you know, actually have requiring them to drive slower, which is a really simple um, way to, to mitigate some of that noise pollution. So, yeah, I would hope there'll be some kind of legislation that happens around those things in the next few years inspired by, you know, that people actually being able to engage with, with those soundscapes. Is there a chance of that, Leah? Does it look as if there's a, just a scintilla of a chance that there might emerge such legis legislation? I mean, I'm an optimist about these things, so I'd say yes. Um, but I guess, you know, all of those things are, are very challenging. Um, but I think certainly at a local government scale um, with, with enough sort of activism and engagement from the community, it's, it's yeah, definitely possible, I would think. But so I that, guess... That's exactly what you're enabling people to engage in, right? Very easily. Absolutely, yeah, Absolutely. definitely. Yeah. And, you know, even to just see kids, how they interact with, you know, we've run workshops before with hydrophones where, um, you know, there'll be kids that are kind of jumping in and out of the water with toy boats. And of course, that sound is just echoing through the river system. And we've had, you know, one of the, the boys who was kind of playing with his toy motorboat in the river, like we gave him a pair of headphones and let him listen to the sound of his little toy boat in kind of burning around the river. And he was just shocked and he was kind of saying, oh, well, the, the fish would be able to hear the sound of the boat. Wouldn't that upset the fish and things like that? And I, I, I didn't tell him that it would. I was just saying, well, yeah, they could definitely hear it. And he um, kind of raced back to his dad and said he didn't want to go out on the boat for the day because the motor was too loud. And then <laughs> his dad came and told off our river listening workshop for you know, putting these thoughts in his mind, but it was quite an interesting process just to see, you know, a quite, a, you know, he would have been five or six, um, have this realisation that the sounds that the boat were, was making would have quite a significant impact on, on the river system. Yeah. Uh, direct sensory input. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So there's also another question in the chat here, which is, um, for both of you when choosing samples of a river map or installation um, how do you choose them both on location uh, and in the selected ones in the final product uh, is it only on uh, acoustic characteristics or is it also on the characteristics of the location uh, so for example here they're saying that within the presentations there weren't uh, a lot of city sounds for the for what was discussed here well may i pick up on that one Hmm. Um, I skipped all the major cities on the on the Danube, which people remark when they look at them, <laughs> because they're all rip rap to hell, is what I say. The, the banks are just uh, banks of, of loose, large rocks piled up, and although you can get amazing sounds from the interstices between rocks in that situation, um, 
the overall river sounds of such locations are not particularly interesting. Um, but I found, uh, I found all sorts of, as you do always, constantly, right, all sorts of very unique, interesting, fascinating sounds in, in small sites, open sites, up and down the river. I, I choose where I'm going to record by ear, just walking along a riverbank, so no boat, walking along the riverbank, listening. Um, and if uh, the sound spectrum of a particular little site and it can be, of course, we, I'm talking about really small, uh, small uh, sites, so to speak. Uh, if the sound spectrum sounds new to me, if it sounds, if it sounds alive to me, my criterion is, does it sound alive? Which I don't define because the, the work, <laughs> the work perhaps gives a definition of that in the outcome. But if it sounds alive, then I settle down to record it. And in the ultimate composition of the work, I select locations not by um, uh, non-audio characteristics, but more by whether that, whether I've heard a similar sound from the river at a different location already, in which case I won't include both of them. Um, but if, if, as I'm playing through all my recordings, I'm finding sites which are within the context of that collection of recordings unique, then they will go in, into the sound map. Leah, how do you select? Yeah, that? I mean, I guess, um, the, I, I guess quite a, an intuitive process based on, on the river system itself. I mean, I guess a little bit of, of both in terms of the location characteristics and, and the sonic characteristics, but generally, yeah, you're pretty intuitive in terms of how um, how the river actually sounds. And I think, again, selecting those, the soundscapes that will appear in a final work, whether it's those augmented reality sound works or, or the installations, you know, quite intuitive as well as to what's representational of, of that river system. And, I mean, a lot of my work is is very collaborative and participatory with the communities as well. And the more recent projects you know, having a lot of Indigenous engagement in. So the sites for, you know, many of the rivers that I've worked with, I've kind of been guided by those traditional custodians of the river as well in terms of where they've suggested to record or where they've given me permission to record, um, particularly in Australian context. So that's been a big part of, of the river listing project as well. That's beautiful. <laughs> mm. And could you could you talk a little bit more about the that kind of balance between listening and making? So kind of how you know how you approach, um, yeah, getting to know a place, familiarising yourself, and I suppose also how that might link between. I know you both currently live close to rivers, but then you also work with rivers that are far away. Like, is for you does it become a big difference between? Um, living close to a river and getting to know it versus traveling to a place to make work. Do you want to take that one, Anaya? <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I, I love about River Sound is its transience. So I never expect that any one small site, any one collection of rocks on the bank where I've been perched one day, uh, whether the water moving past those rocks and sometimes through those rocks, of course, will sound the same the next day. Um, water flow, the, the amount of water flow can change overnight. It can change really fast. If there's a dam release upstream that, and you weren't even aware that there was a dam upstream, that's caught me every now and then. Um, but other conditions change too. So I, people often have asked me if, um, if they would be able to recognize a site near their home just by the sound. And I, my response is not necessarily. Um, and often it, it, it just isn't possible. So that transience is, is, a, is a pure joy to explore and, and to take into account. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I've always been so, I guess, um, you know, enthralled by how river soundscapes change you know so dramatically throughout the day as well you know knowing parts of rivers that i've recorded 
multiple times over years, you know, even so, like every time you drop the hydrophones in the water, it still sounds quite different. I mean, there'll be particular spots where, where I know I can capture um, soundscapes in a way that I might want them for a particular project, but it's still, you know, even just the, the temperature and the time of day can create a completely different soundscape just in, in gas exchange in aquatic plants. So you suddenly get this clicking and popping sort of beneath the surface or, or at the riverbank that um, creates a totally different soundscape to what may have been there an hour ago. So I think it's, yeah, it's completely fascinating how, how constantly river sounds um, change throughout the day. And that idea, I guess, you know, very early when I was sort of thinking about the scientific possibilities of this work, you know, I, I had, I guess, almost this naive idea that if you put the hydrophones in the water and you were hearing this kind of very rich and dynamic sound, then that must be indication of, of a healthy river system. And if you put the hydrophones in the water and it was silent, then that must be an indicator that it's a not so healthy river system. But of course, you know, you can have an incredibly healthy river system that um, isn't necessarily making a whole lot of sound at a particular time of day. And then, you know, many of the macroinvertebrates that are um, so, I guess, sonically incredible to listen to are, are actually indicators of environmental degradation as well. So it's quite fascinating to think of, you know, what might sound beautiful and compelling is actually an indicator that that's um, not a healthy river system. Well, that's a tough one to process. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I guess fascinating as well in that there's all of these, these unidentifiable sounds in different river systems that, um, yeah, that are indicators of, of, you know, different, I guess, measures of health in, in these freshwater ecosystems. And I guess the more we know about what those sounds mean yeah. to, to the health of a river, the better we can understand. And, and I guess further sort of um, validate sound as a tool, as a non-invasive tool for, for understanding river health as well. Which is urgent. Which is Absolutely. Urgent as we see. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a question. You can say, yeah. Uh, um, about recording Tec technically uh, I was curious about your first uh, 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 the first sound file we listened to Anna it was very beautiful with the um, where you talk about the hissing that the river were singing I love the uh, uh, the stick against the ear how they listen to the river by the way <laughs> But uh, there was, uh, I wonder how you did uh, that recording technically, because to me it sounded like the, the hiss was a little bit like moving in the, within the image or in the space or... Could I, you say how you work technically? If it's with one hydrophone or several or... No, it was just one hydrophone. It was a mono recording. And okay. I, am, I am changing, uh, moving the sound just slightly. <laughs> Uh, so that it doesn't, that movement doesn't become the immediate impression you get, uh, but is more subtle, just a little bit uh, as a, as a, um, in parallel with the alive quality of yeah. the, and the way the hissing does change as you move yeah. down. But no, it's a mono recording and I was in, I found a, the right spot for me at that moment to really, uh, Capture it. I'm trying to find a substitute for that word. It's too predatory, but to record it and <laughs> <laughs> just set, settled down and sat on the bank for a long time. I wasn't even moving myself. So it was very beautiful. Thank you. So that yeah. movement was just put in in the late mm. process of composing. Yeah, part yeah. of the spatialization process. It's fun. To, it's wonderful fun to do that. Mm. It's really. A, And can I ask one more question to you uh, about the wild energy piece? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, because I, if I understood right, um, 
sound um, like an archive that you didn't record yourself. Is that right? Absolutely. That you got this sound material through other scientists? Yes. Yes. So um, how do you, how do you, could you talk a little bit about how you then, you, you gather this and you have this enormous, fantastic archive and how do you orientate or how do you go on uh, kind of composing with that material? How uh, the, the process from, yeah. from the archive to, to the piece you present? It's an installation. It, 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 I mean, in its fullest form, it's an installation. It's a multi-channel, nine, four subwoofers and, and seven uh, smaller speakers designed to be set up out of doors. It's in, running in Brisbane now, in Bris, mm -hmm. Brisbane Fest. Um, and I, we, I structured it uh, in what I think of as 11 little episodes, min miniature compositions. Um, Bob and I uh, decided to structure it in such a way that there would be silence between these little episodes in which the ambient sound moves to the foreground of your attention and awareness um, and then slips back and blends in with the recorded sound uh, once the next episode comes in. Each little episode needed to be self-contained in a way because of those silences. I think the longest is only two minutes, but but they feel long enough to um, to individualize all the episodes somehow. Um, so the usual compositional concern with continuity throughout wasn't so strong, didn't need to be so strong. But each episode had to have a distinct shape. Um, I, trying to remember, trying to remember how I selected the various, on what basis I selected the various sounds for the various episodes is, that's sort of impossible to retrieve. Um, but what I often do with uh, such sound sources when I'm composing is listen to relationships, uh, spectral relationships, uh, which frequency bands stand out, how, are they, how do they shape and how do they change between uh, sounds and lay them adjacent so that you slip from one into another. To work with that, which I think sets up um, responses in the body which are able to continue uh, are not uh, fragmented, so fragmented. Um, but also to work with contrast uh, between uh, sound images. Um, but basically it was a really different way of working to, to create these little self-contained episodes um, and very much bearing in mind how we might spatialize them and, and choosing uh, choosing the array, the uh, um, continuity of each episode with that in mind also. Mm. It's, a, it's a loop, it's a 47 minute loop. So <laughs> it has neither a begin. I love that about installations. They don't have beginnings or endings, not mm. truly. I mean, rivers do. <laughs> but mm. It's <laughs> like a wheel. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we should wrap up soon, but I have in the chat here, um, Gustavo has written to me saying that he would like to ask a question. So I'd like to encourage him just to go ahead and do so. Hi, <laughs> thank you very much for this presentation. Sorry, I'm outdoors right now in Lima, Peru. So if there's some uh, background noise. I'm sorry for that. Um, so uh, thank you for this very powerful presentation. Uh, I guess I have just a very broad question, maybe just to start, uh, just, I want to hear you, uh, what are your thoughts are on uh, something I've been thinking a lot on my own work, but uh, I heard like uh, Lea and Nea mentioned briefly uh, something about their engagement with uh, scientific work or scientists. And I was wondering, um, you know, I can see the positive side of that, but also I was wondering if you had encountered any problems or any situation that you have actually thought about expanding the limit or feeling like scientific way of writing, thinking, uh, understanding, knowing the world is actually, and also be a little bit limiting to your work as an artist, right? Like for example, 
scientists look at things, some certain things, but not in others. And I think when we, working with soundscapes or field recordings uh, make us actually capture or at least explore or expand our sensing experience. And I was wondering how sometimes scientists don't really like that because they actually want to focus on something very, very clearly, right? And I was wondering uh, if you had any trouble or any, I don't know, do you have any thoughts on how actually sound or field recordings uh, working with sound might actually expand a bit uh, the way um, scientific scientists work? That's precisely what you're doing, Leah, isn't it? <laughs> what did you say? Yeah, I mean, trying to, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'd say that um, in terms of challenges, yeah, absolutely. There's been, I think, particularly the, the earlier work, a lot of scepticism around the, the value of um, listening to rivers as a valid scientific tool to, um, to monitor river health. And I mean, that's why we've invested sort of so much time in, in publishing in scientific journals as well. So, you know, I've had scientists sort of say things like, well, you know, show me a peer reviewed paper that fish are talking to each other and we can use that to monitor river health. Then you can have your permits to put your hydrophones in the river and things like that. So I think it's been, um, yeah, really important to, to sort of invest time in, in validating the scientific possibilities. But I mean, I've been really lucky as well to work with, um, you know, incredible scientists and, and incredible um, students who are, who are studying ecology and biology who are very open-minded to the possibilities of, of listening and who are, are, I guess, recognizing that many of the current scientific methods we have for monitoring freshwater biodiversity are, are problematic and are invasive and that we can use hydrophones as non-invasive tools. And I think, you know, it's that participatory process in the field, you know, when scientists sort of see community members put hydrophone put hydrophones in the water and headphones on and and kind of engage with the river and and want to protect the river and want to engage with the science and want to engage with the creative work i think it's that intersection of um you know everyone engaging with the river that um that becomes you know really exciting from both scientific and, and artistic perspectives and i think you know it's almost most interesting with with some of the younger students, like grade four and five students, where they're they're kind of seven, or eight, nine years old, and they don't care if they're doing an art workshop or a science workshop. You know, they're they're putting hydrophones in the water and they're listening to the river. It's that interdisciplinarity is sort of inherent in the way they're thinking about what those sounds mean and and how they're sort of using them. So, I think that you know, that interdisciplinarity where, where there's that balance between how we're thinking about rivers, you know, from an equal perspective, artistically, scientifically, engaging with Indigenous knowledge systems in that context as well, but those participatory processes in the environment. And That's I what I'd say anyway. <laughs> I haven't, um, in a way, perhaps I, I haven't sought out a collaboration uh, with any scientist in particular. Um, I think perhaps because I haven't wanted to move in that direction myself so much, but I've always experienced an amazing generosity from researchers when I approach them and uh, say, I know you're working with such and such a phenomena and um, recording vibration, vibratory patterns, vibration patterns and, and vibration data. And I would love to have a chance to, to hear it would you could you possibly send me some they send it right off with with some interest real interest in what i'm going to do with them which isn't always so easy to explain the way i work but um this there's always been a wonderful generosity on the other hand i was recording um insects uh aquatic insects with a hydrophone on the flathead river in montana years ago to make a piece called jitterbug and I had asked a, a biologist, a hydrobiologist, hydrologist, um, at, uh, at a local research institute where, what would be good spots to look for such insects? And he pointed me to three absolutely superb 
areas. I got some amazing sound. I put it all on a CD and sent it back to him with some interest to see how his interest might be sparked by that or what information he could give me about what I'd recorded. I really wanted to know what I'd been listening to and I never heard back from him. So, but that was a long time ago, but that was a sort of instance of the connection between acoustic phenomena and other, you know, data just not being made. It, it, somebody ignoring what seemed to me to be potentially really interesting and useful data. So you're finding in your experience is telling me that that divide is breaking down, which is wonderful. And it's lovely to, to recognize that in kids, it doesn't exist at all, of course. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would like to say a huge thank you to both of you. We, we're a little bit over the time. So I will say, uh, yeah, thank you so much to both of you for the talks. And I think it was really interesting, the different approaches that you take and kind of yeah, the focuses that you have in working with rivers. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. I'll say briefly the next talk that we have in this series on the 15th of September uh, from 5.30 p.m. Uh, Central European Summertime. Um, I'm just going to put a link in the chat if anyone is interested in that. It's uh, called Unrecord Demodernizing and or Uncolonizing Sound Objects. Um, it's with sound artist Nuitsha, researcher Budapitya Chatrapate. So yeah, hope to see some of you again for that. And uh, thank you everyone who joined and uh, for everyone's questions and comments as well. Really nice. So, yeah, so thanks so much, everybody. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with, with each other, with you all. This, this was a lovely event. Thank you so much for inviting my participation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It's been great. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs>